All right. We are recording. Three dudes. <laughs> Three dudes talking about being old. <laughs> <laughs> Although you're not technically old yet, Jimmy. You still I'm, the, I'm, the young. Youngest, I'm the youngest of the bunch. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, the first of, we're doing six of these, right? First of six. Um, we're doing every Wednesday at 11 o'clock. My name is Bronson. We got Jason, we got Jimmy, and we are basically just talking about uh, some of the things that men over 40 need to address, some of the issues we deal with as we get older, how we can approach them, what our mindset needs to be um, in understanding them. And before we get too much into that kind of stuff, just want to kind of introduce each other. So uh, Jason, why don't you get started, kind of introduce yourself a little background and why this is important to you. Uh, all right, so Jason Schreiber, 41. Um, I own multiple businesses. Top Tier Columbia uh, is one. And then um, Evolving Athletics and Noble Training Institute are two others. Uh, so I've been in the fitness and medical field for over 20 years. I spent about eight years in the chiropractic office. Um, and in my career, it, you know, it started off with general fitness people and sort of uh, athletes, like performance stuff. Um, but it gradually started to move into rehabilitation in the chiropractic office and holistic health. Um, myself, personally, I'm a competitive athlete in strength sports, um, CrossFit, weightlifting, powerlifting, kettlebell, strongman even to this, to this day. And personally, when I started my journey in the strength sports world, um, I found that my ignorance to my own health gradually was sacrificing my performance. And so uh, I find that to be regularly the case with, with athletes that I work with. And so in order for me to sustain the kind of performance that I wanted and to feel good day to day, I had to change my perspective, learn new skills, learn new behaviors that um, aligned with my goal of feeling good, performing well as I aged, um, which meant I had to drop sort of the old dogma that I was trained in in my early um, career. Okay, cool. And Jimmy, what about you? So, uh, all right guys, so I'm, I'm Jimmy Violin. Um, I'm one of the coaches at Top Tier and I own uh, the Mindful Performance Center. Uh, we do specialize in physical therapy, hands-on manipulation of fascia, which is called counter strain. Um, and we specialize in that to really help people with um, complicated just issues and diagnoses that um, haven't been addressed or, or can't really find uh, ways to improve their symptoms. Um, we find that we can really do wonders with that. Uh, I, I dove into this field you know, from college, played football in college at Shepherd, um, you know, small D2 school uh, out in West Virginia. And I noticed that I was, I was glorified for being heavy. Um, I was 295 pounds. Um, whew, big boy. <laughs> <laughs> if I showed a picture of side by side, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even think that was me. Um, and I, I, at that moment, I thought I was quote unquote healthy, you know, being, being a, uh, a younger male and you know, right now I'm 36. So I'm not hitting the, the 40 end of where we are, but I'm close. Uh, but my experience is that, you know, my, my knowledge of being healthy was that, you know, eating as much as I could lifting as much as I could was, was, was my priority, especially playing football. Um, when I got out of playing football, I just drastically changed and reverted um, away from that mentality and started to, you know, lose all of the, uh, the adipose tissue that I, I was carrying for years, you know, playing football. Um, and it was something that I really didn't really know that I was carrying something that was hindering my health. You know, I thought I was healthy. Um, I thought I was, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a young bull. I'm ready to go. You know, but at the same time, I was eating Eggo waffles and sausage, you know, maple sausage links every day and drinking like, you know, I thought apple juice was healthy, <laughs> you know, in that, yeah. in that state. So I, I wasn't really familiar with what healthy was until I got out of school. And then I started to really get into the field of fitness. I was a trainer for 
uh, about eight years, and then I got into the, the actual medical field and saw how our system, our medical system is so backwards on how we are addressing these things um, and, and how we can actually prevent a lot of these things from happening just from our day-to-day -day choices. Um, and that's really what I wanted to focus on is really dive into let's, let's prevent things. Let's not actually react to when you have it to try to just manage it um, and, and, and manage this, this, um, this very, very big thing, which is diabetes um, that's so prevalent in our society these days because of knowledge. It's just, right. just knowledge. So um, yeah, that it hits home because I, I, I treat a lot of patients that have it. Um, I work with a lot of, a lot of clients that have had it and have reversed it. So, yeah. okay. So it's uh, a, yeah. yeah, it hits home. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So Jimmy's, Jimmy's talking about the first topic. We're, we're doing six of these, of these, we're going to have a different topic each session. The topic we're going to focus on today is diabetes prevention, understanding what diabetes is, understanding that it is reversible and some other things we'll talk about there. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Bronson Dan. I'm the owner, creator, founder of the Apex Training System, which is a fitness and nutrition program, health coaching program that's targeted specifically at men over 40. I'm 48 years old. I didn't get started in fitness until I was like 39. Uh, I went on a cruise for my 40th uh, birthday and was in the workout room working out and uh, saw this guy over on the corner actually working out, found out that he owned a CrossFit gym in Miami. And I was like, I want to do what that guy's doing. And uh, then that was just kind of it from there, right? I, I came back, came back to Baltimore, found a CrossFit gym, did that, fell in love with it, started uh, training, ended up opening a gym. Uh, and it's been almost 10 years now that uh, I've been on this journey of not just getting myself better, but also helping other people improve their health and fitness. So I'm currently also a coach at Top Tier. I do personal training at Top Tier, out of Top Tier. Uh, I also have some online programs where I work one-on-one -on -one remotely with people. Um, and I do have some automated systems that people can kind of sign up and follow the process at their own pace. So that all being said, let's get started talking about uh, diabetes. And for anybody that's going to be watching this now or watching a recording of this, this is not just for you. This is for other people. Share this information. If there's something in here that you learn, you may already be on your way towards doing some of the stuff that we're going to talk about, but that doesn't mean everyone you know is. You have a circle of influence. You have a sphere of influence. Share the information. Let this let people know what, what we're talking about and how uh, this information can help them, particularly for people who have a history of diabetes in their family who are already concerned about it or may already be pre-diabetic or whatever. There's maybe something in here that can help. So let's get started real quick. Jason, can you give us just a quick couple minutes of what is diabetes? Where does it come from? Well, there's um, two major kinds. It's type one, type two. Um, mm -hmm. So people, some people can be born with the, the condition. Uh, most people are not. And um, the ones that are not born with the, the dysfunctions uh, can essentially reverse um, their disorder in most cases. And, uh, and just to be clear, we're going to focus for this discussion, we'll be focusing on type two, right? That's that lifestyle yeah. stuff that you can actually fix and reverse. Type, type one, you can't get rid of it. You've got to have it. There's ways to manage it and improve your quality of life with it. But we're going to focus on type two because that's something you can actually get rid of. Right. Um, and so in the various forms, you know, the dysfunction, uh, this is um, this is kind of getting into the diagnosis of, of diabetes, but the, the, the dysfunction can, can come either from the pancreas uh, not releasing a hormone called insulin um, and being unable to produce it, in which case we cannot manage our blood sugar levels uh, correctly, and that can be a life-threatening situation. Um, but then you also have the, the potential to have the cell receptors not um, identify the insulin um, that is released from your pancreas. So a person is deemed insulin resistant in that case, uh, which means they have insulin circulating through their bloodstream. It's being produced by the pancreas, but for one reason or another, the cell membranes are not um, identifying that. Essentially, there's a lock and a key when we talk about hormones 
right? And the hormone is the, uh, is the key floating around in the bloodstream. And it's, it wants to lock into um, the appropriate lock. Well, the lock is the cell receptor on the cell membrane. And if the key cannot go into that lock correctly, well, then it's, it's, it, it's functionally equivalent uh, of not having insulin in the first place. Um, right. And so we're, you know, most of the reversal stuff that we're um, going to refer to really deals with improving insulin sensitivity, uh, which means reversing the insulin resistance, the, the, um, the lack of the cell receptor identifying the insulin. Right. So, so the inability for the body to process insulin essentially and use insulin to break down and store sugars, right? We have excess, that's where the H1AC, we have high blood sugar consistently over periods of time, and that causes problems in our body, particularly when we talk about inflammation, right, as a, as a big thing. Uh, Jimmy, real quick, you talked about adipose, adipose tissue as when yep. you were younger and, and at body fat, right? Yeah. So- Body fat is what I like to, I've been heard coined and I call it the, the organ of inflammation. Can you talk a little bit about what inflammation is and why it's not good? Well, the inflammation is, um, it, it just runs stress in your system. Um, it, it provides um, a lot of cortisol in your system that doesn't actually allow a lot of the, the functions to happen mm -hmm. in your body, which is what we need to have balance, balance of blood sugar levels to be able to utilize these foods that you eat and actually get them into the system. So the biggest thing that I, that I focus on with people is, is the sleep aspect and how mm -hmm. sleep is just so, so, so vital to actually balancing your, your body's ability to actually um, keep those blood sugar levels steady. So if you're burning the candle at all ends, if you're not getting adequate sleep, you're, you're, uh, for me, in my case, I have a newborn at home. So it's, it's kind of hard to be able to actually get some solid, you know, four to five hours of good solid REM sleep at a time. And what happens is that then your body starts to actually produce a lot of this cortisol, um, which is an inflammatory response to mm -hmm. not actually getting enough recovery. And then when you start to eat on top of it, that that process starts to become so inundated with the the inability to be able to get these nutrients into the proper tissue right uh, due to the the lack there of rest and recovery yeah um and it's and it's a it's, it's essential yes yeah one of the things about cortisol and we talk about um stress and inflammation there's two two i guess you could call them processes in the body right there's anabolic and there's catabolic processes so when we talk about anabolic process, we're talking about building, restoring, recovering. When we're talking about catabolic, we're talking about using, burning, and utilizing, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and eating, we're talking about eating up, right? We're using the resources, we're using things. So uh, cortisol is very catabolic. It burns through it. It's a, it's a hormone of activity, not a hormone of rest. So when we have, you know, one of the, the aspects of being insulin resistant is a higher cortisol levels. So that means our body is constantly in this, this mode of stress and burning and action and tearing itself down. And it almost never gets to a point where it's able to build itself back up again, because it never gets to kind of switch over to the anabolic process. And that's where the chronic health issues that are associated with diabetes and insulin resistance come into play, because our body is in a chronic, a chronic state of inflammation and stress. So we start to see that in aches and pains. We start to see that in hormone issues. We start to see that in uh, the ability to perform, a lack of energy, right? We need to sleep more. People that have diabetes, they're often talking about, I need to sleep. I feel like I'm tired all the time. Right. So there's a lot of different things that are indicators because of that cortisol, that stress that's going on in the body. And your body, your body itself is, is in a state of, of flight or fight. Basically. Right. Always, time. always. Yeah. It's always, it's always yeah. like, what's going on? What's going on? I got to survive. Yeah. I got to survive. You have a balance of being in the flight or fight or rest and digest. Right. And, and at the same time, we need to have balance in life. We need to know how to go into each phase of, of life. If we're not sleeping properly, recovering properly, mm -hmm. um, digesting properly, you're not going to be able to get into rest and, and recovery at all. Right. That, that 
that that <clears throat> cortisol drip is always on. It's just, just, it's just always just pumping out, pumping out. Your right. adrenals are just pumping out, and nothing can actually sustain that for that much time. Things start to right. break down. And, right. uh, there's a difference between the stress you get, like when you do a workout, and maybe you can talk a little bit about this, Jason. There's a difference between hormetic stress and chronic stress. Mm-hmm. Right. There's a difference between, hey, I, I'm stressed. I got a little stress on my body. I did a workout. I'm stressed, but then I get a chance to recover. Versus, if I try to do 24 hour workout. That's that would not be really good for someone. Every day, too, seven right? <laughs> right, every day, seven days a week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, hormesis, like the that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger concept. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so everything in life is stress um, in some fashion, right? Like it, meaning our body is constantly being trained and uh, adapting to the stimuli that are that is happening in real time, every moment of every day. Um, and, you know, one of the tools that someone can use to, to um, decrease their risk of and uh, attempt to reverse their diabetes is exercise. But as with everything in life, we can overdo it. And so, um, you know, we need the minimum amount of stress required to create the, the most positive adaptations that we're looking for. We don't need more than that. In fact, right. doing more than that is likely to set off a cascade of events, much like Jimmy and Bronson are saying, where we're now increasing sympathetic tone and, in, and driving the production of cortisol levels even higher. We see it very common in uh, high, inter- high intensity interval training worlds like CrossFit, like functional fitness. Doesn't mean that those are bad things, but it does mean that um, as, as people over the age of 40 in particular, right, we, we need to be aware of those activities being, um, being potentially harmful if used inappropriately. Yes. Uh, and so if, our, if we're in a disease state, like if we're pre-diabetic or we're already diabetic, you know, and constantly uh, being, being um, stressed by just our own biology, and then we go into, let's say, a CrossFit style gym, and we define a quote unquote good workout as I'm going to kill myself 10 out of 10 effort until I'm lying on the ground in a sweaty pool and uh, you know can't breathe. And now I've checked the box, I've done a good job, I've got my exercise in, I'm helping myself out. Uh, the reality is that combination because of the disease state done too regularly will actually work against us. Um, but you know, what if that same person went to the same gym, did the same workout, uh, but chose to coast at like a seven out of 10 effort during that time? Well, now that's a different, uh, adaptation that we, we cause. Um, so educating people on, uh, you know, these choices, uh, and putting their own personal health and lives in context around those choices is a big part of coaching. Right. Yeah, and you mentioned a good thing too there, particularly as we get to that 40 and over for guys. For guys, let's just, we're talking about guys, right? So things that people think about, don't think about as we get older, because I know for me, it was a while, that, and it's still something I struggle with, right? I'm almost 50, and I still think I'm 24, 24, 25 sometimes when I'm doing things. You'll look like so, a 24, 25. Yeah, thanks, appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh it's, it's, it, I have to remember, and thankfully I'm in a business where I'm looking and reading and hearing and talking about it all the time, but it, it takes a, a, a knock in the face sometimes to go, Hey, you know what? It takes almost twice as long for me to build muscle. I have a higher production of cortisol as I get older. It, it, you know, all of these things are actually, as we age are skewed against us. And it, it, we have to actively be deliberate about doing things to kind of reverse and maintain. So we're already kind of looking at the edge of that cliff, kind of our body's ready to jump off at any minute. We got to hold it back. So we have to really be aware of what we're doing. Um, what are some of the things, Jimmy, what, what are, what is like, let's just, I'm going to ask you one question. Give me one answer. Sure. In your opinion, what is the number one cause or, or thing that impacts people in their lives that puts them at risk for being insulin resistant or pre-diabetic? Well, I have to, I mean, I'm going to go back to kind of tagging what I said pre- 
previously is, is sleep. Um, okay. and, and it's the, one of the most overlooked aspects of people's life. They always say, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing in the gym? What, am, what can I eat? Um, all these, those are like the two things. How can I work out more? What can I do to like focus on my nutrition? Before that, I would say, let's, let's, let's dive into how your lifestyle is. Let's mm -hmm. dive into how, how, what's your day like leading all the way up before you actually shut everything down and put your head on the pillow. Yep. And then how long does that happen? How, how, how efficient are you sleeping? Mm -hmm. That's one other aspect. Um, not just you in bed, you could be wide awake and you could have your cell phone on or, or you could be having the TV on. So, but it's, it's really how well are you, uh, how well are you recovering? Um, right. It's the sleep life. Okay. Right. If, if you dial in everything else, working out and nutrition, you cannot, you cannot get yourself out of this hole if you're not recovering properly. Right. So, and that takes, that takes a very consistent focus. You can't just say, okay, one night I got 10 hours. The next night I got two and the next night I got three. Well, I got that 10 hour like two days ago. So I, I'm pretty good. Eh, it doesn't right. really it's, it's not, it's not like, it's not like it can't, you, can't, you yeah. don't get no make up sleep. You know, right? It's either you got it or you don't. Right? You know, this sleep on weekends and then go hard during the week, you know, yeah. you know, two out of five ain't going to work. So you got to look at it. Like it's got to be a consistent lifestyle change, you know, change things prior to you actually getting yourself to wind down daily. And I, I recommend following the sun, following yeah. the rhythm of the sun. Okay. We're human beings by nature, you know, this artificial light really causes our bodies to really kind of um, stay kind of tuned up longer throughout your day than you really mm -hmm. do or, or should. So this artificial light. So when we can kind of follow the rhythm of the sun, that really helps to get you more in, in sync with the earth. Jason, turn on your red light real quick. Let's oh. see what uh, Mr. Jason has in his house. Got it. Okay. Speaking of, of speaking natural, of follow, <laughs> natural light, trying to get some, some, some natural stuff. So, uh, yeah, he showed, us, he showed us before we started. There it is. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I this is just, we, I, we weren't planning on doing this, but he <laughs> said something about it before, earlier on the call. So Jason, tell us a little bit about red light and why you use it and what changes you've seen talking about sleep since you started using it. Yeah. So, um, the sunlight, you know, so, so Jimmy brought up the sun, right? Everything on earth is tied to the sun. Uh, you can't escape it even if you tried. So um, there is a, a wide spectrum of wavelengths that come from the sun. And uh, we'll simplify, these aren't the only two, but um, there's infrared and there's ultraviolet. Um, and so there's all these different wavelengths coming from the sun and most people these days live out, or I'm sorry, inside, right? They spend very little time outside. And actually, if we follow what most uh, medical advice still is, is you know, pitching to us, uh, we should avoid the sun in the middle yeah. of the day. Uh, and if you do go outside, you should cover yourself in yeah. sunscreen yeah. to prevent the sun from giving you skin cancer, which... Right. We're talking about diabetes today, but that is gross. We can do, uh, misinformation. Yeah, we could do a whole yeah. other episode just yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, and so you know, we all spend so much time indoors under the artificial light in front of our technology. Well, all of that artificial light is the blue wavelengths of visible light, and the red wavelengths. So in this case, infrared, which is what's shining on me, is um, is the kind of the antidote to the consequences of just being exposed to blue light. So the reason why people, or a reason rather, why people when they're outside in the sunshine regularly um, and have gotten acclimated to being outside and no longer get burnt, um, the reason why they feel good is because the red wavelengths are entering the eye and the skin and are countering essentially any harm that the blue wavelengths are doing. So human beings, unfortunately, decided that we're going we're gonna to isolate the blue wavelengths, use it for our convenience and our technology, and never really stop to think, well, what kinds of consequences might that create for our biology over time? And so I brought the sun inside my home, right? And so it's wintertime here in Maryland, and 
uh, you know, before this month, I would spend a lot of time outside every single day as long as it wasn't raining and uh, in the middle of the day in particular. But now, like everybody else, it's colder. I don't want to be outside as much. So I'm trying to be disciplined with my health and bring the sunshine inside as best I can. And, and you just started doing this recently. What have you noticed yeah. that change? Yeah, so we just started uh, actually a couple days ago. And um, I'll tell you, the, all, all I do, like this is as simple as, a, it, I made it really simple in my life. In, in the evening time, when I'm just chilling watching television, I just turn this thing on and let it shine on me. Um, you're not supposed to look directly at it, just like you don't look directly at the sun, but otherwise you're fine. And um, I'll just let it, you know, shine on me for an hour before uh, going to sleep with, you know, television watching. Mm -hmm. And um, both my wife and I have done this. And we, the very first night, felt like we slept way better. Uh, and she was telling me that she feels like the, it, she used it um, multiple times throughout the day because she teaches from home. Yeah, she was saying that um, she could tell like it improved her mood a lot and made her feel much more calmer, generally yeah. happier. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just in a few short days and I didn't change anything. Right. I lived my normal life. I just shined this light on me while I did it. The light on. Yeah. Yeah. It's I think the the we talk about environment and how environment affects our health. And most of the time people are thinking about other people that you're interacting with or the situations you're in when they talk about environment. People don't think about things like light, air quality, you know, things and things, other things that are actually environmental factors, not just, it's not just who you're with and what you're doing, but it's the actual environment. So, right. So yeah. very simplistic. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's so simple. Oh my gosh. Our body reacts to things around us. <laughs> Uh, not machines. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So there's two more things that I want to address when we talk about causes or, or where diabetes comes from. I'm going to talk about one, Jason, if you could talk about the other, I'm going to talk about, um, well, I'll pick, do you want to talk about processed food and carbs, or do you want to talk about seed oils versus, uh, um, plant versus animal and fruit? Oils? Uh, you, you do the animal versus, versus plant things. Okay. Like you got a little bit okay. more. Yeah. yeah. So, there's, there's two main things. Uh, when we look at modernized society, we talk about the things that we eat, the things that we put into our body, right? We've talked about working out. We all know we should do that. We talked about getting sleep. We all, we, we know we should do that. When we put food into our mouths, we've been told for years, uh, two things that are ab absolutely 100% incorrect. And it's unfortunate that it's what everyone still believes. The food pyramid is based off of it, all these things, right? One is that animal fats are bad for us. And the other one is that um, carbs are healthy, right? And I'm not saying that carbs necessarily aren't healthy, but the problem with that, with that line of thinking that JC will get into a little bit more is that because fats are now bad, we're, right, butter's bad, uh, meat is bad, all these things are bad, um, the amount of carbs, the amount of processed foods that we've ingested has exponentially increased. And if you look at the combination of those two pieces of data and you look at the food pyramid when the food pyramid came out, I'm not saying causation, but there's a very interesting correlation between the amount of carbs and processed food and reduction of fat, of animal fat in our diet to the increase in diabetes and obesity in America. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous from the late 70s, early 80s and up to now. So if you look at that kind of information, um, we talk about inflammation, right, is, is one of the key factors to health and how when you're insulin resistant, your inflammation is higher. Well, one of the things that makes that adds to that and uh, I guess confounds that issue is seed oil, seed oils um, versus uh, animal fats, right? So we talk about fats, omega-3s, omega-6s omega and all these types of things saturated fat versus, versus uh, unsaturated fat. For years, we've been told that saturated fat is bad. Cholesterol is bad. All right? If you have a high cholesterol, um, you're unhealthy, you're gonna have a heart attack. Well, newer, newer, I'll say newer information, it's actually not newer, it's been around for 30 years, but information that people are now starting to become aware of is that heart attacks, heart disease, cardiovascular disease are all actually a cause of inflammation. And 
a lot of the medications that we get put on don't actually work to, to the root cause. They're band-aids on things. They don't fix the problem. So that's why you see people who go get um, statins or, or whatever, things like that, and end up having a heart attack still, or they go get their treatments, they do this stuff. Um, and it just, it's, it's better for us to look at what is happening in the trends in medicine and in people's lives sometimes than to look at just the information we're given and take it at face value. People got to ask questions. If this, is, if this is the case, why are things getting worse, right? So the recommendation on oils, um, if it is a seed, right? So we're talking about sunflower oil, soy, uh, flaxseed oil, what are some of those? Are those probably the most- Safflower. Safflower oil, corn uh, oil. Canola. Canola oil, right? So all of those things are made from seeds and they are processed heavily they have low flash points, they burn, they get rancid. There's so many different things wrong with, uh, with the way that uh, our bodies function when, they, when we eat seed oils. If you want to go to something that is healthier, if you're going to use oil, it is okay. There's actually been studies more recently that have shown butter, lard, right? Eggs, egg yolks, gosh, please eat some egg yolks. Please, please, please eat some egg yolks, right? Fish oil, uh, all of these things, natural animal-based oils decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease, decrease your risk of inflammation, decrease your risk of diabetes, okay? So uh, my recommendation, it's what I do, right? I haven't had a seed oil, I don't know when the last time even when I go out to eat, I ask, hey, what are you guys cooking this in? If it's soy, if it's, if it's you know, any of that kind of stuff, then I'll just get something different because I'm not going to put that stuff in my body. Uh, that's why I love Buffalo Wild Wings. They cook all their, all their wings in lard, right? It's freaking fantastic. It's awesome, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's if, you, if you want to go out to eat somewhere and you like wings, but you don't want the crappy seed oils, go to Buffalo Wild Wings. They did not pay me to say that. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's just, just uh, one thing to keep in mind. If you do, some people like olive oil or avocado oil, things like that, um, those, are, those are more okay as well. And if you look at it evolutionary, evolution, is this evolutionarily, is that the yeah. word? Yeah. We, as, as humans, we evolved eating animals. So how can there be anything wrong with the fat we get from animals, right? Plants are plants grow, they want things to eat the fruit so that it spreads the seed, right? The seed is not designed to be eaten because that's what's supposed to grow the new plant. So if you look at it from that perspective, we, we are, we, we've evolved eating animals, plants want us to eat their fruit so it spreads the seed. Those two things are probably okay, right? Don't eat the seeds. Don't eat things that come from the seeds. It's not where we're supposed to be. So Jason, you want to take the next one, processed food and carbs? Yeah, so um, that correlation you know, model that you mentioned with uh, the lowering of fat is essentially identical. You know, can, it, it comes hand in hand, as you mentioned, with the increase in consumption of refined carbohydrates. Um, you know, carbohydrates aren't bad or good. Uh, they're, they're just one of three potential well, technically four potential, but um, sources of, of food energy, right? And when people get in debates about carbohydrates and um, being good or bad, and particularly in relation to diabetes, uh, it's pretty easy to weave through those debates and kind of get to the, the crux of things. So um, using, you know, uh, Bronson's analogy or, or example rather about um, fruit, Right. If you think about how carbohydrates are found in nature, they're not isolated. They never are. Nothing in nature is isolated. Right. And so, you know, the sugar that's in the fruit is accompanied by a lot of various micronutrients. It's also accompanied by a lot of water and a lot of fiber. And um, the way that sugar is going to be absorbed, which ultimately is the key to nutrition, in my opinion, is absorption. Um, the way that that's going to be absorbed is vastly different 
than uh, if I decided I'm just gonna, uh, you know, make some pancakes and put a bunch of, you know, fake, you know, sugar corn syrup uh, on it, right? And the, and it becomes even more interesting. I mean, we probably won't go down this rabbit hole deep, but uh, inside your gut, you know, you have a, um, a whole world that's living inside of you that's separate from the rest of you, right? It's called, we call it the microbiome. Well, in there are bacteria, there are viruses, there are fungi, right? There are different kinds of parasites that are living symbiotically with each other and ourselves. And when we consume something like the fruit, the fiber uh, feeds the, the, um, the microbiome. And in return, the microbiome provides us with various nutrients and vitamins that we couldn't have produced for ourselves. Now, if we decided, you know, we're going to skip the fruit and we're going to just double down on the pancakes and corn syrup, uh, unfortunately, there's no food for the microbiome except the refined sugar. And uh, a great, uh, great um, fungus that most people are familiar with is candida, for example. Um, we've all known or heard of women getting yeast infections or uh, an HIV patient being diagnosed with thrush, which is a candida, um, uh, you know, overgrowth in the oral cavity in the mouth. Candida loves refined sugar. And um, if we decide we're going to feed candida amongst other things, a bunch of sugar repeatedly, then those particular organisms are going to become so overgrown and it's going to disrupt the ecosystem inside of our small intestine that uh, we, we add to all the inflammatory markers that we've already discussed in this whole webinar, right? And so sugar and carbohydrates aren't bad, but if you're going to use them, you may as well source them from what nature wanted us to source them from. And it's pretty rare in nature to find uh, plants and animals, I'm sorry, well, mainly plants, plants and, and fruits um, to be high in, like unusually high in carbohydrates. Um, there's some exceptions with some roots and certain fruits, but again, even in those few exceptions, they're usually packed full of a huge amount of fiber um, which is going to slow the digestion down quite a bit. It's also going to um, you know, feed our biome in a way that's very beneficial. So the sugar, the overconsumption of sugar is a huge part of the diabetic problem um, because it's easy to produce. It's cheap to, to put into every food thing we make uh, and it's addictive. And so Anyone who ever worked with kids knows if you start feeding your children uh, processed things and you know sugar-based stuff, you will quickly see behavior that is aligned similar to an adult addict, and yep. and and so it makes sense why we'd have you know this epidemic um, happening because there's all these different sort of you know battles that we have to fight that the cheap sugary food is so easily accessible, it's so convenient to get, and it makes us feel good right now. So why should we care about the diabetes 20 years from now? Right, well, and that's, that's a scary thing right now because not only has obesity and diabetes scaled up over the past 30 years, 40 years, but childhood obesity, childhood diabetes, right? Early, yeah. early onset, um, we're talking about at juvenile diabetes. I mean, diabetes back in what the 1800s, it was sugar sickness and it was the rich people who could afford sweets. Right. It wasn't a general population thing. If you were rich and you lived in a mansion and you had servants and you had sweets, then you could get diabetes. Nobody else got it because what did everybody else eat? Everybody else ate meat and some veggies. Right. That's what the, the, the surf population, the peasants, that's what they ate. Uh -huh. You know, now it, where we live in such an age where all of us can eat like kings every right. day and we can get whatever we want uh but even worse than that is we now have an industry that makes money off of us eating that way right so fat is bad so we you know we take fat out of everything 
what do we have to do to make it taste good? Because fat gives flavor. Well, fat, we take all the fat out. So now I got loaded up with sugar so that people will eat stuff that we buy. And oh, wait, they, they like eating it more now. Oh, let's make more. Let's do this. Let's give sugar 50 different names and put them on labels so people can read a label and not see sugar and don't realize that there's still just as much sugar in here as there was before we put the healthy label on it. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's that's one thing to keep in mind. And Jimmy, I think two things to keep in mind. Jimmy, you you mentioned this. You know, who knew that apple apple juice was bad for you? <laughs> right. 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 Because just when what Jason was saying, apples, there's a big difference between eating an apple and the amount of sugar and carbs you get out of that as eating a glass of apple juice. Right. One one glass of apple juice is like four or five apples. Yeah. With yeah. zero fiber. With zero yeah. fiber, zero nutrients, zero. like none of that stuff is there. It, it's crazy. Like we're it's concentrating in it. Yeah. yeah, we're concentrating everything. So when you think about, uh, I'll just touch on this real quick. There's a term that everybody needs to understand. It's called nutrient density, right? Nutrient density is the key. The higher the level of nutrition a food has, in most cases, the lower number of calories it has. So if you're looking at how much do I eat, you know, Go to go towards foods that may be lower in calorie but higher in nutrition. Chances are, when you eat that, you won't be able to overeat it, right? That's why I love eating meat. Meat is, is so high in nutrition and so low on calories. I can eat a, a pound of meat and be full for hours and not have to feel like I need to eat again. Get all the nutrition I need, and I never overeat my calories for the day. It never happens because 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 it's just that's how food works. So just something to keep in mind, guys, nutrient density. We'll probably talk about a couple other terms in some of these other videos, um, but bioavailability, satiety, other things like that, some of those terms may pop up. I know Jason's big on that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> let's talk about, let's talk about uh, the thing, just in summary, we've talked about, you guys get, tell me if I got this right. Get more sleep. Mm-hmm. Reduce your processed carbs. If you're going to eat carbs, make sure you know what you're doing as far as where they're coming from. They should be whole foods as much as possible. Um, I, I'm going to say increase your meat intake. I don't think enough people eat enough meat, or protein. Uh, that's a whole nother issue from a body composition perspective, which we haven't talked about is when you increase your protein intake, it helps you burn more fat. It helps you build muscle. It helps you burn more fat. So when we're talking about from a diabetes perspective, losing body fat, Without even talking about exercise, you can increase your protein and there's a very good chance that you're going to see an overall loss in body fat. Right. Okay. Um, so that's something else. And then the, the last thing, um, well, two more things, get sunlight or get red light and then reduce or completely, I'm not even going to say reduce, stop with the seed oils. Go to fruit, go to animal-based oils uh, and you'll see some huge differences. You guys have anything you want to add to those things? Um, one thing that really helped me a lot, like, you know, 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with pre-diabetes and it shocked me a lot because I looked, I made the mistake most people made, right? Like I looked lean and muscular. I was athletic. Um, and I'm like, what? Like, and I was eating the way my, you know, the food pyramid at that time taught me to eat, you know, that's what my, my university taught me to do. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, Every certification uh, you know that I ever went to back then told me the same thing, and here I am getting you know uh, diagnosed with Jason. If you don't change some things, you will be diabetic soon. Um, a major thing that a major tool was fasting, actually, um, fasting, and I definitely yeah. did not buy into it at first, for sure. Mm-hmm. I resisted that quite a bit, um, but I will tell you after you know three, four years of consistently using it now, still doing my life. Um, I really think that that also had a major part in, in like my personal journey, reversing my condition, yeah. Um, yeah. Just, you know, making sure everything to me, I, the way I work out of my brain is it's all, it's a form of training, right? Like that I am training my physiology to, to become better fat adapted, um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, develop the metabolic machinery to manage, uh, you know, just day to day function without regular feeding and right. over time that led to much better management of um, sugar when I would consume things like carbohydrates. 
Right. I'd like to add that in there too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Being fat adapted. That's a good, that's a good. So fasting, there's, there's the whole ketogenic um, lifestyle. There's fasting. There's a bunch of different things you can do from a low, low carb, uh, man, a carb management perspective. Uh, and the idea of being fat adapted, just to give a quick explanation of that is your body can burn fat, your body can burn glucose or sugar. So basically it's, they're, they're both fuels. Your body is really more efficient when it's burning fat. There's less inflammation. There's a higher energy output. It costs less for your body to actually do that. It can burn fuel. It can burn carbs. Um, I like to use the analogy of gas versus octane booster, right? When your body's burning fat, when you're fat adapted and fat is your primary fuel source, your body's running on the gas like it's supposed to. There's nothing wrong with popping carbs in there every once in a while if you want to, right? For a workout or you know whatever people use carbs for different things, but you wouldn't fill your gas tank on octane booster. You would destroy your car, you'd destroy your engine because it's not meant to be the primary source of fuel. And that's how I look at fat and carbs. When you get that balance right, everything just works fantastic. Uh, Jimmy, real quick, what is, um, crap, I just had a question that totally just, whoop, just, flop, just popped right out of my head. Um, I come to man, you. <laughs> man, what, what, I was thinking about it and then I started talking and it totally just left. Uh -oh, uh, I was going to say, um, <laughs> if you were from a diabetes perspective, because um, since that's it is what we're talking about. What would your, explain to us why exercise is good. We'll just go there. We'll go there first. Why, well, is that, why does exercise help? Yeah, I mean, the stress, again, when it's appropriate, when yep. it's healthy, um, it actually starts to utilize these energy systems that we're, we're speaking about properly. Mm -hmm. And that, that actually helps to move the needle to get you more into that insulin sensitive portion. And that's, and that's how we want to live our life you know, all the time. Right. So, Cause then we can actually take in our food. It goes into the proper areas and it, and it functions properly and it reduces the inflammation in our system. And that's the whole, the whole name of the game is to get the appropriate stress to get the appropriate adaptation to food, uh, lifestyle. And like Jason said, the absorption of proper nutrients into mm -hmm. your, into your system so that you can function properly so that you can balance your life right uh, the exercise is just one component when like i said when done appropriately when done adequately um then it provides an outlet for you to provide with that that healthy stress um but again just like uh, jason said it could it could easily turn into too much stress and inflammation which causes you then to be in a state of of uh, flight or fight all the time. And right. it doesn't provide you the outlet that you need. Um, it actually is the thing that's causing the, the breakdown rather than right. the actual healthy outlet. So from a, from a, when you're looking, when we're talking about fitness, it's a good idea to find a place where they have a program that's well-rounded, that it, the mentality is a long-term mentality. There's a lot of places you go, like Jason was talking about earlier, you go in and every day you come in, it's like, bang, 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 bang. This is, this is what it's all about. And there needs to be an understanding that, you know, I'm, I'm almost 50. I'm hoping to live for another 30, 40 years. I, I'm not going to change my life and get fit in one workout. I've got time. Like I'm, I'm only halfway through my, almost just a little over halfway through my life. Like it's not, it's not going to happen overnight. It didn't take somebody six months to get as out of shape as they are. It took them 20 years, 15 years, 30 years. It's going to take some time. And when you approach your fitness routine, you have to understand that just like anything else, it's going to take some time. You're not going to get it all done overnight. Yeah. And there's not, and Paul check is one of our uh, heavily used resources on this subject. There's not a, a bad exercise or a terrible workout. It's only the incorrect prescribed workout for that individual right. or that exercise for that individual. So when you look at different elements of, of fitness and, and how, you know, we're, we're CrossFit coaches. Yes. Yeah, so this is, this is, you know, pushing towards that, that style of exercise, which is high intensity circuit training. I'm um, in a group setting. It's not for everybody. 
at the time. You know, it has to be recommended and prescribed appropriately for it to be right. the correct stress the right in stress. that window for that time. Right. And that's where we have the options, right? And so we're going to segue real quick into talking about what we're doing at Top Tier. That's where we have options of personal training. We have options of group classes. We have different types of group classes. We have mobility classes where it's just come in and learn how to move your body. We have kettlebell stuff. If you're not comfortable with barbells, we have kettlebells that you can work with. So we have tons of different coaches that have experience levels all over the place, doing all sorts of different things at all sorts of different levels with all sorts of different people. Right. So there's, there's, there's something at top tier for everyone uh, to find a home and do something that is going to work for them because of that. Like you said, that prescribed uh, that individualized need that someone may have, we can figure out where to make that work. Here. Yeah. hundred percent. And I, I don't mean to cut off. I have to go teach actually in like three minutes, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a good segue, but, but at the same time, what we also offer at, at mindful performance center is a way for us to tap into these areas to help you with identifying dysfunction of these vital organs, um, the, the, the body's ability to be able to actually utilize um, hormones effectively and appropriately um, orthopedically we know how to actually dive in under underneath the hood to be able to help mm -hmm. you actually get yourself in a better position so that we can get you closer to being able to do group fitness if that is a goal. Yep. You know, if not, let's get you into a program where we can help you identify where we need to start. You know, and that we can take a closer look and put you on the right path. Cool. Awesome. All right, guys, this is it, I guess. Um, Share this with, with if hopefully some information here was helpful or, or something new and maybe you hadn't heard before or you know someone else that could use it. So share it out. We're going to save it off and post it probably on the YouTube channel, yeah. on all of our YouTube channels or something like that, and then uh, get it out there. So appreciate you guys being on and we will see you same time next week. Yep. All, right, all right. Take it easy, guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you. All right. I got to hop off.